to talk about change and setting the current context, just as Adam and I were referring to, and share some research, uh, which Dennis led a few years ago, which looked at the vital ingredients of organizations which are highly change enabled and those things which also disable sort of emergent, dynamic, um, organic change in organizations. And we hope that that in itself will be useful, but there's some other very, very practical things that we're, we'd, we'd like to leave you with as well. Um, so we've hinted at the context already, and I guess um, nothing would be complete without sort of referring to these very, very unusual times. So I think uh, some of you may have even participated in, in it. I think um, back in uh, April or May, we, um, we were intrigued by what the uh, whole pandemic was going to catalyze and accelerate in terms of changes uh, for managers and leaders. And uh, we were absolutely overwhelmed by the responses that we, that we had. So just to share those very, very quickly. Um, we heard that there was a huge amount of commitment to have a look at how we uh, change and manage and the assumptions that underpin how we change and manage. And that is going to be something that we look at later today. Um, more collaboration. I think this uh, recent adversity has probably healed more wounds than it's created in many, many organisations, which is to be welcomed. Um, there was also, and this is reflected in both the Build Back Better thing, uh, you know, the 200 CEOs, uh, Nicola Lovett among them, who I think Adam and I both know, um, the present CEO of NG going to uh, Boris and saying, actually, this is a tremendous opportunity to um, divert from a trajectory we were on before, which wasn't particularly good in terms of our environmental performance, in terms of sustainability, or indeed in terms of uh, social equality. So there's quite a big appetite for positive change in that area as well. Productivity is also something I'm going to touch on shortly, uh, and I believe, firmly believe there's opportunities to make improvements there that um, are being brought into sharp focus by the current adversity. Um, and yeah, hasn't it been wonderful to see how the kind of the, the, the mindset has shifted towards valuing those people that work at the sharp end, you know, the NHS frontline workers for sure, but but beyond that as well, I think that is also very much kind of long overdue. And so it was really, really good to hear that the leaders that we engage with were thinking in exactly the same way. And this old chestnut, organisational structures, um, I think that this global experiment that we've been thrust into, you know, the remote working thing, for us is great. Um, most organisations had a policy and the technology five or even ten years ago, but it wasn't really the done thing, if that makes sense. So we had no choice but to jump in and jump into the deep end, start thrashing around, getting it work to work for us. And surprise, surprise, so many of the people that we talk to are reporting how that actually has improved productivity, it's improved people's work-life balance. Uh, so some pluses and minuses admittedly, but coming out of this, giving people real flexibility to work at a time and in a place and in a way that they are able to bring the best of themselves is really, really a great thing. I think what we would say is that, um, you know, that in, or, in and of itself is great, but that is at very much just the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, moving on from that, there are different levels of trust and autonomy and relationships 
that can exist within organizations that you know perhaps we have the opportunity of seizing that we, we wouldn't have without COVID. So all of this is all good stuff and it's, it was wonderful to have that sort of um, level of commitment from leaders. Um, but what we also know is change at an organizational level is something that many organizations really, really struggle with. Um, so this is a, a, a good opportunity, I think, to take a fresh look at that. And that's absolutely what we're planning on doing today. So um, today is really about joining the dots. Um, organizations are not as productive as they need to be. Far too many people are disengaged and uninspired by their work. And as we've said, getting real hearts and minds change to happen in organization, uh, in organizations is, is, has proven to be difficult and has been for just about as long as all of us can remember. I think one of the things that we're hopefully going to be sharing with you and discussing with you today that actually all of those problems, those serious challenges, opportunities, share some very similar, similar causes. So we're going to focus on change, but we're going to start with a much more holistic perspective than that and look at the organization in its entirety. And, uh, and when we do that, we discover uh, the unfortunate truth that work really isn't working. Change isn't changing either. Um, Dennis and I have recently finished um, supporting a module on change at a very prestigious MBA program. And what we noticed going on concurrently with our input really hasn't changed that much from, you know, 30 years ago, probably the, 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 the Cotter stuff and all of that. Um, we'll be tackling the very, very troublesome question, how do we get change to happen in all organisations? We'll be sharing our research around change-enabled organisations, organisations which continually, through participation with their people, are able to organically and dynamically adapt and respond and be on the front foot, as opposed to the more conventional sort of top-down programmatic approach to change. We're going to leave you with some practical steps that you can experiment with starting tomorrow. And if we have time, we will uh, take a look and share some of the things that we've learned about progressive organizations. Those organizations which already have um, high levels of um, autonomy, and distributed authority. And although they never set out to achieve it, seem to have uh, enabled change to happen without the need of management diktats and programs. So we're gonna, if we have time, we will take a quick look at that. How does that sound for people? Does that sound like a reasonable way to spend an hour or so this morning? Thumbs up or smiles? Cool, thank you. So, um, I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but the solemn truth of it is, is that work is not working. So it doesn't matter really what we look at. So this happens to be a chart of productivity here in the UK. It's pretty much flatlined since the uh, financial crash. Um, if we look at um, employee engagement, over a similar period, this happens to be the US, but it would look no different for any Western economy. Um, you know, and this is despite all of the focus on well-being and mental health and employee engagement and um, surveying our people to death. You know, this is stubbornly jogging along at, at, at a level of which we are probably all quite ashamed. You know, more than half of, depending on whose data you look at, but, you know, Gallup, um, more than half of the people are in work are, you know, are dissatisfied by it. And we spend a lot of time at work. So for every reason, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. 
And there's other data that, that Dan and I could have shared with you today, you know, the uh, lifespan of S&P 500 companies in the US used to be at around 60 years, it's now dropped to about 20 since 1960. Um, economy wide uh, return on assets has dropped from sort of 4.7 to 1.3, kind of over the same period. So, does anyone have a clue? <laughs> Come on. Does anyone have a clue why these things might be true? What do we think? Come on, Barry, I can tell you're dying to have you say. Martin, well, I'm short looking... term goals rather than long term thinking? Long yeah, term like that. Point. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, we don't have joy in work, do we? And I think if we could find, uh, if we could um, construct the work, if you like, so that there is more joy in it, then that would obviously make a difference. Yeah, like that. I, think I guess. Sorry. <laughs> no, go carry on. I, I was just, I was just saying actually, uh, Ben. I, I noticed obviously that that sort of flattening out if you like comes around about the same time as the 2008 crash so maybe organizations since then are focused more on um profit and growth and survival rather than on people maybe mm. yeah uh, my my question would be what caused the productivity increase before um and i think this is a wonderful graph i've, I've not seen before so what really happened uh when that dip showed on the graph, because my impression has been that um, we have been pretty steady at doing unnecessary things in most organizations. A lot of reporting doesn't help anybody. A lot of work that is just kind of ticking boxes and keeping managers happy and managers who maybe would like to manage better, but they don't know how. So they ask um, their people to do things that add no value whatsoever. Um, so th I think I have a pretty, I don't know, a f a f at least a, a satisfactory to myself um, <clears throat> understanding of why we do so many things that are not productive. But uh, can you, Ben, explain, or anyone, can explain that dip? What happened after the, um, uh, the crash in 2008? Uh, wh why did we take a dip in productivity at that point? So uh, I think that's a really good question. Uh, it's very, very clear from the chart that there was a, you know, in your language, uh, Luca, there's a special cause there, right? Um, so uh, Adam's already said, um, and I think he's absolutely right, there's, uh, there, there, was a, there was probably an emphasis on survival and profit and not on people. Uh, I would also add that and this is directly to your point, Luca, about lots of non-value adding activity in organizations. I think when bad things happen, leaders try and take control. So they layer on more bureaucracy. And um, so I think that probably plays, plays a part as well. And, you know, if you are in that mindset of, of um, minimizing risk, then it is very, very unlikely that you're going to be doing some highly innovative, expansive, creative stuff that's going to kick both of those graphs up, right? Because that's what people love to do. They love to be creative. They love to. They love new. They love developing stuff. They love solving problems. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a combination of of both of those things. I mean. Uh, the two sort of footnotes that I've put to this slide are absolutely have absolutely been covered in from from your input. So the first one would be, you know, 49% of people would take a pay cut in return for a better management, uh, better manager, according to Gallup. Uh, that 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 has got to have something to do, I would suggest, with both of those graphs. And the other one. To your point, Luca, around non-valuing activity, you know, there is this thing called bureaucracy, which uh, we're going to return to, uh, I think, a few times this morning. And uh, I think if we could remove some of that bureaucracy, 
um, then we would also see a positive input on both of those both of those graphs. Well, systems drive behavior. Yeah. And the system says you better be good this quarter, or you may not be here next quarter. At least that's the one in the U.S. And consequently, uh, people do what they can. If you're the CEO, you do what you can to drive the system so that you'll be good next quarter. Or you'll be good this quarter, so you can still be there next quarter. So it's, it's caused a much more short-term focus for organizations. Uh, it's hard for organizations to take a long-term view because the stock market and, and the financial system is going to be judging you based on this past quarter or this quarter's performance. <clears throat> that, Frank, yeah. And that, that reminds me, Martin's here, that reminds me when I worked for EMC in the States, they were purely driven by three monthly objectives. Everybody was tasked with a three monthly objective. They were making about 70% return on investment. And then Dell took them over a few years ago. Um, but the whole culture there came from the top and it was, it was a hard driven culture. You've got to make the sales targets. It doesn't matter about rework or waste. You've got to make the target. And, and they knowingly sold products to major customers that they were never going to use, but they'd made their target and they'd made their profit margins. And more importantly, the individuals had made their bonuses. So this short term, focus on management by objective, which from my background knowledge says has been driven by MBA programs predominantly in the last 20, 30 years, it is an issue. And the other point I think Ben, you mentioned, somebody said about prob people like problem solving by looking at these graphs. And that's another big issue I have, which I've, I've mentioned before at a Deming meeting. And that is there's too much emphasis in educational programs about problem solving are not process improvements, and it's the wrong way around. We sh the, the problem should be problem solving should be a minor aspect of what an organisation does, not a major force of what an organisation does. And and I was saddened to see that when I did some desktop research, Harvard uh, of, of saying, "Oh, we've got this fantastic problem solving," and so have some of the big OEMs in the automotive, and so has uh, Cass Business School in London. Nobody that I could find about five, eight years ago was doing anything on MBO pro, MBA programs on process improvement. And I think that to me is very sad. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with all of the above. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the, the thing that we are um, particularly interested in that, that maybe connects a lot of those things is the way that we manage our people, yeah? It is how, what, what as leaders do we say is important? You know, long-term survival versus short-term numbers. Uh, what questions do we ask? Um, what freedoms do we give people, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's really the thing that, that we, uh, that our research points us towards in terms of answering this question, what makes some organisations able to, you know, organically and dynamically shift and change and move, and what creates the impediment to that? So what creates change disablement, if you like? So the way that we, the way that we manage people, um, how has that changed, do you think, in the last 60 years? Just your, your just very, very quick thoughts. How has management of people changed in the, in the last 60 years? I don't think it's changed very much. You, sorry, Robert, you think it has or it hasn't? I don't, no, I don't, I don't think it's changed very much at all. If anything, it's uh, gotten worse, driven by the focus on the short term. Uh, sure. There was an article in uh, Business Week, I think it was in 1996, 
uh, can't recall the name of it. Uh, it had something to do with unbridled something. But it was about the CEO of, um, you know, it's hell being old. <clears throat> and your mind won't work. <laughs> Bosch and Long. Bosch and Long was a company. And, uh, you know, they, they got a new CEO. And this guy looked like a little bulldog. He sat down at the table and he says, all right, boys, here's how we're going to play. I need double digit this. I need double digit that. Da, 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 da. And if you want to be on my team, you'll play my game. Well, people had careers at stake. So they played the game. And in the process, you know, they, they laundered money for a guard, drug guard cartel in, uh, in Miami. Uh, they, uh, filled up warehouses, I think in Hong Kong with glasses that they couldn't sell. They filled put them in warehouses and claimed they were sold. You know, they did a lot of things like that, hit their numbers. And uh, it took a while, but it finally caught up with everybody. Uh, and the CEO was fired, but he didn't care. He had several million dollars in the bank that he'd earned by hitting his numbers. Uh, you know, people, the, the directors, et cetera, loved him because he got results. But the system was driving that. The system says yeah. you got to have results. That's the reason I say systems drive behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I, 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 I partly or mostly agree with what Robert just said, actually. I think um, from, from my perspective, if I actually look around me, I don't see a lot changing. Um, and I think there's two things here. I think one is, is how the company deals with changing the, its attitudes and management towards people. And then how the individual, the individual line manager um, does that. I think if I actually look back to my first day at work, which was now back in 1979, I kind of I see a hell of a lot of change today than I saw in those days. You know, um, the way the office was laid out, the way we interacted with our colleagues and managers, the way that it was like more like a school classroom in terms of sit there at your desk, keep quiet, you know, while your manager smokes and around. That's, it's a, a million miles away than it is today. But I think to Robert's point, I think he's absolutely spot on in that a lot of companies, you know, try or, or they implement processes and systems and employee benefits and ways of working that are meant to push us in the right direction. But when it comes down to the individual, your line manager above, there's very little evidence that they are being coached in that direction. And I still think you have the same, um, you know, um, political situations, the same uh, prejudices. I still think a lot of that still exists today. And again, as Robert says, driven by, you know, p and um, driven by targets driven by all those bad things in, in business it doesn't allow people to flourish or recognize that everyone's different and needs to be treated in very different ways so i see a lot of positives but i think i think say robert's right there's still there's a lot of historical bad habits around um and i think the last point i was going to make you you know there's been that when i were you know working with circo at this time i always rated them as a company um in that you know i, do, I don't think um any organization um, always gets it right, but I think the best organisations try to get it right, and I think that's that's just a gentle nudge we have to keep heading that that direction. Yeah, yeah. no, I'd agree with that. Agree with that. And uh, you know that I think that's helpful in terms of distincting dis distinguishing between the individual and uh, and the system, because the one drives the other, and the, uh, uh, and and that's a that that is a two way street. So there there are good people with positive intent who, because of the system, will perhaps not do the right thing in terms of their uh, line management. Okay, so um, we're gonna have a bit of fun. So I said, how's it changed in the last 60 years? Um, if we take a look at what was, uh, what, what the landscape of people management looked like in the 1960s. The pre-existing stuff uh, included this little nest of delights. Um, so a lot of this, you know, we can trace back to um, the turn of the century stuff. Um, and then the stuff that emerged 
in the decade was this stuff. So my question to you guys is, you know, do we have, do we still have at least some of these things alive and well in our organisations today? Uh, ben, yes, I don't know if you hear me. <clears throat> ben, I think we very much do have a lot of this alive in our businesses and organisations today. And if we go back to F.W. Taylor, who you're describing in the grey block, um, he hasn't gone away by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Kevin. And, uh, <laughs> and that's absolutely... Sorry. You can see it manifested in Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma and Agile. Mm. It's just come round again. And the real issue with those and why they gain a lot of credibility is that they're easily packaged into things that you can sell, you could administer and you can give certificates for. But if you want to pick up the stuff that Martin was talking about, which is serious cultural change, that is not easily packaged. That's not easily sold to the organization. So for the CEO, he wants to get into improvement. He can just pay for all of this training through the HR budget or something like that, get the certificates on the wall and look what we've achieved. And of course, they've achieved absolutely nothing because they haven't tackled the core problems in the organization, which I regret to say, as Robert saying, are driven by shareholder requirements. And let's not forget that the uh, Companies Act in the UK is extremely specific. The shareholders do not own the business, but it seems to be the tail wagging the dog. Mm. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, no, thank you, Kevin. So uh, I think what you're saying there, and I absolutely agree, is the assumptions about around management, which actually um, were generated around about 100 years ago are still kind of alive and well. And that's, and that's absolutely uh, one of the things, one of the key messages from our little chat today that I hope would come out. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, just, just for a bit of fun, let's compare and contrast. So that's the management landscape of 60 years ago. Let's just compare and contrast that with the technology landscape of 60 years ago. Uh, and I guess we're all connecting today via either some sort of personal computer <laughs> or telephone or perhaps a tablet. And God, if you said you, you had a, a tablet habit in the 1960s, people would have probably would have thought you were uh, on LSD. But, um, you know, these, all of these things, whether we're looking at, you know, household goods, automobiles, civil aviation, communications, uh, doesn't matter what technology you look at, it's absolutely clear that all of those things have seen sort of multiple episodes of revolutionary change in the last 60 years. And I think we're all in heated agreement that management has not. Now, it is an oversimplification, but you know where are Dennis and I coming from with this is there really are only two explanations for this. Either people management was fully optimized and developed by 1960 and it can't be improved any further. Or for some reason, management has got stuck and people management <coughs> got stuck. And for whatever reason, we haven't been able to shift it. Uh, and sadly, if we reflect back on the productivity data, the return on investment data, the employee engagement data, it's not looking terribly good for the first option that people management is fully optimized and developed. But this is now going back to Kevin's point around, um, around the underlying assumptions. We need to go back much further from 1960 to understand how these sort of management traits that we know are no longer serving us well where they originated from. So would anyone like to hazard a guess 
where on this timeline from 1750 through to present day, when on that timeline do you think most of our modern, modern day management was developed? And I think Kevin may have given you a huge, great big clue, if not the answer. <laughs> Well, I think about 100 years ago or so, you had something called scientific management, uh, which basically was time and motion studies. And that was predominant for quite a while uh, in terms of, you know, how to, how to get change, how to get productivity out of the group. Uh, and I think then, I, then that's the, the thing I can recall the next was the management by objectives, which came in in the 50s early 60s, uh, management tends to be faddish. They need to have the latest thing, you know, and whatever that is. And for a while it was continual improvement there, but they call it continuous improvement. And of course, there is no such thing as continuous improvement. I think yeah. it goes back even further than that. If you actually look at the start of industrialization and start to look at the bureaucratic models that were developed, by the way, Terry and I have a major paper coming out on this shortly. Um, bureaucratic models, it actually started in the 1750s. Um, and the, it came about simply because, and it was the railways that did it, um, organizations found themselves having to organize their business over large distances. Um, and we got bureaucratic models uh, developed at that time. So, um, yeah, it really started before 1800. Known as train wreck management, Kevin, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> right. I think the Americans perfected that. Yeah, cool. So the, the, the bit that I'm really, really keen to focus on, um, accepting absolutely... Kevin's point that, you know, this started long before um, the end of the 19th century. But, but there, was a, there was a very, very narrow sliver of time during which uh, an awful lot of change happened in this space. So at the end of the 19th century, um, 90 percent of people working in, in um, in agriculture, so very local, very family centric, very um, sort of uh, yeah, micro micro enterprises, if you like. And the closest thing to manufacturers or factories were probably blacksmith shops that typically had certainly no more than four uh, employees. So it was a time of farming and cottage industries, um, and within a generation, all of that changed. You know, at the time that the mass production took off, there was an absolute imperative to get hundreds and thousands of people in off the fields to arrive on time in very large numbers to diligently do the same thing over and over again. And what we what we wanted in effect was people to work like robots. And we were incredibly successful. It's often demonized now, but you know, productivity soared, and so did wages and with it standards of living. So if we look at that uh, little slice of time, what we found, and um, Robert and Kevin have, have both alluded to the, to the guy already, is this idea of scientific management. And the job of the manager is to stand over the workers with a stopwatch ensuring 100% uniformity, uh, consistency, productivity, etc. And that generated a number of assumptions which we suggest are still very, very much alive and well in management processes and behaviours through to this present day. So the sorts of things we're talking about is this huge thing called trust. So we start off from an expectation that people can't be trusted. So therefore we need rules, procedures, etc. Uh, it is of course the senior people that know best. We shouldn't let workers make decisions. Uh, performance arises uh, from control. 
human resources well we want them to behave by robots so they are just that they are just they are just resources and i think this um chimes with something i think robert said earlier is this idea of the organization as a machine you know linear predictable mechanistic and not the sort of complex adaptive system that we kind of know it to be so all of those things are um alive and well um in our organizations today um, and we may not talk about them overtly but they are absolutely there and you know if we want a present day example when lockdown was announced and organizations went switch had to switch within a week of remote working the the the, the sales of spyware that got installed on employees machines so that they could be uh, effectively checked up on you know how many keystrokes per minute time logging on logging off where their internet browser goes etc cetera, etc cetera. it was absolutely huge and if that isn't an absolute epitome of uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor thinking scientific management then I don't know what is so um, I hope that this is set kind of a scene we do need to start talking about change now but i think it's unhelpful to look at change without looking at the context of organizations okay. and, their, and their current realities and how people feel about work and how we perhaps haven't got it all right in terms of how we enable them to bring their best can i just add something then please do Taylor didn't put it that they can't be trusted. He was far more brutal than that. He said the man shoveling stuff isn't intelligent enough to understand how to improve the job. And therefore specialist managers have to be brought in to work out which is the best way of doing the job. And Taylor actually drove a wedge between planning and doing, which we still see rife in a lot of organizations today so we have to go back to that core element where he said you can't be trusted and i'll come back to this later when i'm sure you will at some point talk about what actually drives people uh motivates people and i'll do the link back then lovely thank you kevin could i just come in on that ben so it's just an observation on the um, pretty much aligns with what kevin just said as well is that um i think we spoke a, a, a few minutes ago about you know um technology and industrial revolutions driving change and I, I i i don't think they do i think they enable change i don't think they drive it and i think it's the behaviors that drive and i think a typical example of this and this plays into it perfectly is that um you know we we've had video conferencing technology around for 20 years i remember using it when i was at alfred mccalpine's back at the end of the 90s yet it's it's to, 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 to because i'm in change communications i know it's actually um consequences that drive these behavioral changes a lot of the time but it's actually now only now because of um, coronavirus that we are actually starting to use it from home and work remotely and it is down to this thing about trusting people just don't have never trusted their employees and now because they have to we're actually seeing that enabler um, being allowed to work yeah and Ma Martin here Ben just look at your bullet points and, and some of the thoughts I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking the time that that Taylor came up with his ideas to me, it seems to reflect very much on, on the social class system within the UK and maybe elsewhere in the world. There was this hierarchy um, that the upper classes are in control. And I think that still pervades today. The people at the top of the tree still think they are in control. And if you like, the, the work just have to do as they're told. <coughs> I think this, it seems to smack to me of the, of the social class system. Now, maybe that's, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but I'm sure that's true in other cultures as well that I might be able to think about. Mm. Yeah. Remember about Taylor. Yeah. You he was the past president of the American Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Kevin, could, could, Kevin, could you get closer to the mic? Because I can barely hear you. 
Yeah, I've got a bit of a problem with the new edge. Oh, right, OK. The other thing to remember about Taylor is he was the past president of the American Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Right. So in searching for his one best way, he would have been highly influenced by all the laws of thermodynamics and physics and electrical engineering that were, be were emerging at that time. So it would have been very natural of him to think down that sort of narrow, narrow path. Right. Yeah. So Martin, you, you mentioned their control and that is something that we're going to be uh, really uh, focusing in on and unpicking it in the context of, of change because we believe that it is uh, absolutely one of the fundamental things that, that can either enable or disable um, adaptive change in, in organisations. There, so, uh, there was a paper, an article in, of all places, Vanity Fair, uh, about 10 years ago called uh, Microsoft's Lost Decade. And it was about how Microsoft's focus on short-term stuff in the, you know, they evaluated the people quarterly and uh, they were using Jack Webb stuff of, uh, you know, 20% are superstars, 7% are, you know, just there, but they're, they're not superstars and what 10% I believe are uh, on the way out. Uh, which led the, the change the behavior inside Microsoft uh, uh, to managing your career. So you did what you could to make sure that when you got your quarterly review, you were in that top 20%, at least, you know, you, you should be. Uh, I used to use that when I was speaking with groups. I would ask them, well, you know, how does that work? Your are your, uh, 20 10, 70, and I would pick a part of the group and I would say, well, now we'll say that, you know, you're the top 20%, which means you're going to get the big, biggest bonuses. You know, you're the future of the company. You're going to get the development, that type of thing. How do you feel about that? Oh, they thought that was great. This is a good system. I'd turn to the other side of the room and I'd pick about 10% and I would say now, unfortunately, you're the guys we're kind of embarrassed about. You know, we, we made them mistake when we hired you and uh, although we've tried to develop you it hasn't worked so uh you know you you don't get your act together you won't be here how do you feel about that well they weren't happy about it at all they said there's something wrong with this system because we know that we're as good as any of these other guys and then you look at the great unwashed group in the middle there the 70 percent and ask them and uh, well, they don't like that at all either because they feel like they're just as good as the top 20. Uh, and I said, well, you basically, you have to make a decision. If you stay here, you really don't have a future. Uh, so you might want to leave and find a company where you can be in that top 20% or so. But they were so busy doing that, at, you know, managing these things internally with their careers that they forgot about developing new products, improving existing products, that type of thing. Consequently, Microsoft had about a decade there where not a lot was coming out. Right after that, Microsoft announced that they were doing away with their stacked evaluations. And at the time, Microsoft was selling for about $27 a share. And I thought, hmm, I ought to buy some of that. <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> Microsoft selling for about $180 here today. Yeah, so it's inter it'll be interesting to compare and contrast that story with, uh, if we have time to get to it and, and share some of the stuff that we've learned about progressive organizations where um, decision-making authority is disseminated much more broadly in the organization and um, bureaucracy is actively removed, you know, the very thing that Microsoft was lost itself for for a year um, in, in, in just as you described, Robert. So uh, we need to get on and start talking about change. No discussion about change would be complete without this chart, would it? Um, so this is what change looks like. 
Well, that's what the consultants or change management trainers would have us believe. Uh, I don't think, I don't personally believe that that is what change needs to look like. I would say that it uh, is probably inevitable that that's what change will look like if a very small group of people at the top of the organisation uh, decide amongst themselves how it's going to be. Um, but uh, I'm guessing that most of us have seen it before. Um, the first time you saw this, did it did it echo your experience of an organisational change that you were part of? I'm not seeing your video. I mean, your your chart. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, has anybody else lost the video? No, it's good. I can I can see it. Ben, I can see, uh, yeah, yeah. it's it's the Kubler-Ross change curve, basically. Yeah, you got it. At. So, yeah. so, and I, I, I've got a vested interest in this, Ben. So I won't go into too much detail, but I'm committed to it. So, I, I, I know, <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. There's so many change models out there. If you look at them, um, I like the curvy ones because they're more aligned to people than the process. So that's kind of, that I, I do. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about it after, outside this meeting, but it's it's part of my business strategy, so I do. Cool. <laughs> uh, I, I look forward to that. Yeah. I look forward to that. And um, so, uh, Adam, yeah, go to the top of the class because we are well, of course, going to stratify everybody. You're in the top twenty percent now, so that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, Kubler Ross. Um, does anyone know what? Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's profession was and, and what caused her to describe this? Adam's nodding. I, I, Come okay. on, Adam. <laughs> I, would give, 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 I mean, it's like, because I, I studied, I mean, she, she, was, she was into counselling. She was descri describing the bereavement process. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So... The, the change curve, as we know and love it, actually depicts a death. Uh, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she was a Swiss-American psychiatrist. She wrote the book based on her observations of people's psychological responses to knowing of their impending doom. Interestingly, she never described it as being linear. She never described it as being a predictable sequence. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, popular culture and probably the bloody management consultants are responsible for, for, for that. Um, my question to you guys is, is it an inevitability? Does organizational change need to feel like an impending death for those people who are um, affected or will be affected by it? What are your thoughts? I don't think so. I remember a story actually about some, um, I don't know, Western, maybe American consultant in Japan. Um, uh, you might be all familiar with it, um, or some of you might be familiar with it, where the consultants were getting frustrated because the Japanese were consulting and consulting about a proposed change uh, initiative. And uh, yeah, the consultants were asking, when are you guys going to actually go and do it? Um, uh, but the Japanese stuck to their guns and they did it the way they thought it was right to do it. And by the time the decision was made and um, the, camp the, the organization said, okay, we are going for this, we're going to change from day D. Uh, on day D, everyone started to, to do things in the new way without any cultural shock, any bereavement uh, uh, reaction, uh, any opposition. And the reason was that because during the consultation, everyone got on board. They were bought in because they all contributed to the, um, to the, the idea and how it was all going to work. So the, uh, the Western consultants just watched in amazement how uh, you know, that curve did not appear at all and it all worked. So the time that the organization was spent um, sorting out a mess after deciding to go for change was actually spent consulting uh, everyone beforehand and then everything was happy ending. Hey, that everything worked out. Yeah, I think uh, that is a wonderful lead into, um, you know, where Dennis and I are coming from this. And, um, 
uh, I don't know who the consultant was, but it but it but it may well have been uh, Peter Sangay or someone who was kind of in his clan at the time. He's very often um, has this quote attributed to him, and I, I, it isn't rightly attributed to him, funnily enough. But that's a, of an irrelevance. I love the quote. You know, people do not resist change; they resist being changed, and um, We've talked a little bit about control uh, earlier on in the session, and I think that is really absolutely the, 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 the nub of it. So uh, the way that I, we I, like... I, sorry, Ben. Go on, Adam. But, no, I was just going to add in, so I don't, I don't want to take over your presentation by any stretch. I think, I think you're absolutely right and spot on. I think, I think that the, the, the change curve in itself is... is uh, is legitimate but I think I think the problem is it and as you pointed out it's it's, it's too rigid um, and people have implemented it as and this is why why this businesses struggle because they say this is the change you will go through where in actual fact you know I think I think psych psychologically people do go through that curve but they can go through it in about 10 minutes um, if they're in a certain place and it's how that curve is managed I think which makes it a different shape and 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 you know if, if you've successfully engaged people um, you know what what they what you, what senior leaders perceive as negative actually might be a positive to another person. So that messaging is very different, and people will, will go on that journey in their own different ways. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I think our build on that is uh, is 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 around um, giving people the opportunity to not through some sort of tokenistic consultation but giving people through distributed authority uh, the ability to absolutely not just shape the change, but, but encourage people to step forward and, uh, and lead it and, and not prescribe from the top the, the how, the when, the, the how much for, etc. And certainly if we have time, not looking like we will, but maybe we'll have to do it in another session. If you start looking at um, progressive organisations, that's absolutely what they do. And it's funny, isn't it, that they are able to be some of the most dynamic organisations on the planet, and yet they never have, you know, a change initiative, a programme, and a management diktat, and kind of, this is how it's going to be. So we personally don't believe that um, it is an inevitability. Um, the connection that we make between change in organizations and Cooper Ross's work is this thing called control. So what have you lost the moment that you hear that you, your, your time may shortly be up? You know, for us, it has to be kind of the ultimate feeling of loss of control. Uh, and that invokes that emotional roller coaster and it isn't linear and progressive. People will bounce through those various stages a number of times kind of in their, in their journey. Um, so we don't feel it's inevitable, um, but what is vitally important is um, that we, sorry, I've gone too far ahead. What's vitally important is that we distribute around the organization how decisions get made and what is important for them. So just in terms of, um, the link with Kubler Ross's work and this thing called control. I'd like to bring Dan in here because there was some work that he's done that I think really, given the nature of the work, really helps to underline this this uh, the impact of losing control on people's kind of mental state. Yeah, it, it was a, a very interesting experience. We, we got involved um, with a little charity in the southwest of France, which has subsequently become a national charity, but that's another story. And I was asked to have a look at the training that the people who worked um, with their clients needed. And the issue was that the charity is called Cancer Support France. And it was about supporting people who've either discovered that they have cancer or that a close member of their family has cancer. And this is not something you ever do by choice. It happens. And when we did a little bit of front end research, what came out of it was this 
appalling sense that something else was controlling these people's lives. They couldn't see it. They knew it was there. They couldn't do anything about it, but it was there. And then when you compound that by saying, but you're also dealing with the French healthcare system, which was a sort of black topic for an awful lot of these people. What we did when we actually looked at their training needs, what we discovered was that if the goal that these people working with the sufferers from cancer, if their goal was to get the other person or the people to start making action decisions, then that restored their sense of control, not completely, but partially. And that's why we've used the expression, at least a semblance of control. And it turned out that that was the most useful thing that we could do for any of these people. All the obvious stuff like providing interpretation services at the hospital, transport to and from the hospital, all of these sorts of things, yeah, of course. But in terms of their state of emotional well-being, the most valuable thing that we could do was to get them to start doing something. And the minute they started taking those decisions and then turning them into action, then that restored a, a sense of control and they started to feel better. And then we think that was probably the reason why the whole thing ex expanded at the rate that it did, because this very, very simple thing that we were doing was actually working. So it was, it was a, a good insight into the big source of emotional distress was this sense of having lost control. And that's exactly what happens when change is done to people. Ben. Can I just uh, add something? Um, th it reminds me about uh, the effect of placebo, uh, you know, yes. tablets, for example, but yes. any, anything that's placebo, um, which I often describe as remembered wellness. But the thing is, what a placebo does by, by, by taking something that may or may not help, but believing that it can, is actually giving a little semblance of control, isn't it, to the individual. Yes. And I just yes. wish, I mean, I, keep, I always keep coming back to the pandemic. I just wish that we had said to people, take extra vitamin D and that this will probably give you some protection. And whether it would or wouldn't, it would have been a wonderful feeling that people could have that there was something that they could do that would make a difference. Yes, absolutely. Ben, your mic's off. I feel you this sound that, Barry, but I concur with it. But the real problem is, what do you think some of the press would have made of it and the slagging off the government? <coughs> What, uh, this, this, Barry, this, what we mean, advising, advising something like giving vitamin D, everybody taking vitamin D. I, I don't know. Uh, the media are um, uh, on their own mission, aren't they? And I was just wondering whether that's something else that gets in the way of real improvement that you have another force out there that is, uh, feels it's their mission in life to hold uh, governments and businesses to account based on um, the flakiest of um, reasons. It's not going to help. No, well, that's the point I'm making, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to help. No. Okay, um, I need to move on, if that's okay. So, um, yeah, this is a reiteration now, but for us, what is absolutely key is whether it's in the context of change or day-to-day -day management, is how decisions get made by whom, with what input and with what transparency that is all important. Um, I fear that we're probably not going to have a chance to talk about um, progressive organisations today. Uh, all I will say is what unifies all of these organisations is they set out to work with the grain of uh, human beings and 
Uh, through that, they have enjoyed all sorts of success. Um, the happy consequence of that is also uh, organisations that do not need to indulge themselves in the usual approach to change either. So in pursuit of this sort of how do we design, manage, organise ourselves such that we will enable people to give their very, very best, um, those organisations that have followed that path and you know some of them have been at it for 60 years or more, uh, as well as enjoying incredible success have also developed a way of, um, of ingraining organic and dynamic change in organisations um, sort of unconsciously if you like. Uh, I am going to skip over the corporate rebel stuff because that's more about progressive organisations than it is around the change enabled uh, organisation model which we really do need to give ourselves enough time to cover so we can we can do um, a session on progressive organisations we'd be delighted to do that um, but unfortunately it's kind of not for today so um, at this point I'm going to hand over to Den who is going to talk us through um, the research that has been done um, in order to identify what it is, what, what are the magic ingredients that reside in organisations that enable them to um, adapt and, uh, and exhibit organic dynamic change. Then I'm going to pass over to you. So uh, give me a nod or a thumbs up or something when you want the next slide. Yes, please. Look, sorry, just can you go, can you just go back one just for a moment? Sorry, Ben, thank you. Um, a tiny bit of background um, here, because this is a, a very old story and it started back in 1989, 1990. And I became obsessed with one particular question. And the question was, why is it that some organizations can turn on a sixpence? They can change without breaking into a sweat and other organizations are completely the opposite they're changed disabled they are rigid or dead if you wish and it was trying to get an answer to that question that prompted the research our problem in doing the research was we hadn't got the foggiest idea what we were looking for in other words we, we didn't start with a theory and then set out to get data to support it or challenge it we just set out to get data and not knowing what we were looking for, we built an extraordinarily complex, huge database with something like 140 odd inputs and something like 90 outputs. And we just threw everything at it to see what would happen. And when we got into the data, we started to discover that some of the things that we thought might be connected were in fact not. For example, there was no correlation anywhere between size of the organization and its ability to change. Some big companies were very fleet of foot, others were hopeless. So, and then we, we checked out a whole series of stuff like that and came to the conclusion that the probable obvious um, drivers of this, this state of change disabled or enabled just simply didn't hack it. We then, what actually cracked it for us was when we tumbled to the fact that we built a spectrum of change enabled organizations from highly change enabled at one end to dead at the other, and then chucked all the data we had at that spectrum. And what we discovered was that there were distinctive differences in the management practices of the companies at one end compared with the companies at the other. No great surprise about that in the sense that, well, management's making a difference or it's not. And if it's making a difference, then it must be something to do with management. 
and you're going to sound it's going to sound as if i'm nicking one of your lines but it turned out that it was the management system that contained the clue to this so what we did out of that was we had this horrendous database with which was hugely insightful but completely useless as a practical working tool and what we did was to distill it down to 15 outputs and 26 inputs and those are represented in the picture on the screen right now and the crucial message from this particular screen is that this is a many-to-many -many model every input impacts on many outputs every output is impacted by many inputs there are no simple linear relationships in there at all they're all complex they're all interconnected but that has some good news that we'll come back to in a moment. So what we're talking about now is a database with 26 pairs of inputs and 15 pairs of outputs. And when we look at the outputs, we discover that organizations which are sitting on one side of the fence are extremely capable of changing and organizations on the other side are not. And it's what Ben said, it's the difference between static, episodic, formal, structural change and stuff which is organic and dynamic, two good old fashioned words. Organic comes from within, dynamic, it's an unending process. So where we, this is where we ended up. And then we turned that into a practical tool where we collect data on the 26 inputs and we can define where the organization is against the theoretically ideal on the outputs but please notice that the inputs here are management practices they're things that managers do and the questions that we use to collect the data are very specifically non-judgmental they're observational they're indirect if we want to find out about topic A, we ask a question on topic B. And by using the non-judgmental questions, we avoid data contamination. Because they're indirect, people don't know what we're measuring. They can't give us a fudged answer. They can't give us a politically correct answer because th those possibilities are not there. We simply say, tell us what you observe as you go about your job. Do you see this or do you see something different? So that's the model that sits underneath the um, change enabled organization model. We collect the data, we process it through the engine. It's a form of artificial intelligence, if you want to call it that. Inference engine is its strictly speaking proper name. And it produces some charts. And if we could have the first one, Ben. Here we've got an organization. If you look at the heading it's got a change enabled index of 72 percent now if we can just pause at that before we go any farther that's the highest percentage we've ever recorded and it's a long way from 100 percent and we think we don't know this but we think the reason for that is that it's actually impossible to get to 100% because the stuff called government regulations and legislation, which forces people to do things which are strictly speaking, not sensible. So we, we think a, a result of 72% is actually fantastically good. Uh, if you look at the left hand of the two radar charts, you see a green line and a red line. And what we do in processing the data, we separately process that which is good news and that which is bad. And the good news is turned into that green line, which in an ideal world should be as large as possible. The red line, which we generate processing the bad news should be as small as possible. And then you move to the right hand side and you see the aggregated scores where we process all the data into a single score and we use that to calculate the index so this is the way we present our data if you look at the right hand chart look at the aggregated scores chart the blue line we've got spikes sticking out 
in connection with our approach to customers, experiential learning, the focus that we have on products and services, our approach to system performance and improvement. We have another one for sense of direction and so on. And each one of those is an opportunity to improve the system. But before we go on to that, if we could just look at another chart then. Here we have an organization where the index is running at 41%. And you can now see on the left hand chart that the red line is actually bigger than the green one. The area enclosed in red is greater than that enclosed in green. And that means we're talking about an organization with more bad news than good news. You look at the aggregated scores and there you see again some, some spikes sticking out, but that blue line is anything but looking good. It should be as small as possible. And if you think that's bad, then try this one on for size. Here you've got a change enabled index of 17%, which is the lowest we've ever recorded. We've never seen a lower index than that. On the left hand chart, the green line has become a dot. It's effectively disappeared. And you've got this thumping great big red line in closing a large area. Go to the aggregated scores. And you can see that the blue line is, is almost running at the maximum possible. So this is the way we present the data. We present it as the sets of charts plus an index. But then we invite people to start working out what they're going to do about it. And there are two ways of dealing with it. Here's the first. Have a quick wander through that table. Right, these are three of the outputs that Indexer produces its data for. So on the left, we've got three outputs which are strictly bad news. And on the one on the right, we've got the same three outputs, but the good news version of them. So the development opportunity is how we move from the left hand column to the right hand column. And we would be interested to hear your thoughts on that subject. If we want to shift from the left hand column to the right, how do we actually do it? Anyone brave enough? Any and consultants out there? <laughs> that's a million dollar question. And this is where this is where the difficulty is, in, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we know what it should look like. It's on the left. Oh, sorry, on the right. I beg your pardon. We know what it does look like. It's more like on the left. But the question then becomes, how the heck do we make the transition? What do we actually do? I, th I think I think it's great actually I, I was just going to say I'll, I'll take the third one if that's okay because it's very yeah, much aligned to, to, to what I did which is, is is change communications that's my business and I yeah. think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head here I always say the first box here which is about the business strategy developed and communicated formally to me that's communications uh, yeah. however if you move to the right uh, where you've got this influence by others in the organization, that's when it becomes engagement. And that's where you should, a good company should be, move away from just one way communications towards two way engagement. Yeah. Absolutely. But getting that shift yeah, involves, difficult. and I, yeah. if I just use one thing, Adam, getting that shift involves a little issue called power. Called what, sorry? Power. Yes, yes. Because the, the left hand column, it, the third line is an expression of power held tightly by people. Absolutely. It, it, yeah. Mm. And they're not going to let go of it easily. So you can't just turn around to the client and say, hey, guys, you've got to give all this power away. They are saying, who the hell do you think you are? Yeah. Close the door on the way. <laughs> I, I, see it, I see it every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll give you some clues on how you can make the transition. But anyone else like to reflect on how we could transit from the left hand side to the right what i have seen um in you know approaches in and i'm, I'm not saying i've seen them all but um the uh, almost a shock approach um show 
leaders what their current practice is doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take them to, to the points where the organization is failing customers because of the practices that are enforced at the moment, um, and they realize what they're actually doing to the organization, that they're going to go a bit, they're going to have a bit of a wobble. Uh, and in that space, when they kind of, they're realizing, okay, uh, we can see now this wasn't working. Uh, there is a window of opportunity. You can present them with something uh, that will work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting little challenge. Let, let me approach this from a slightly different direction. And, and Adam, thank you for your support in this. But anyone like to suggest that what's happening on the right should not be happening? Anyone think the stuff on in the right hand column is bad news? No, well, it should be. That should be what you're looking to move toward. Yep. Is that? But, but you got to move toward that as opposed yes. to just coming in and saying, okay, we're going to change. Yep. Why? We, we're perfectly happy doing things the way we are. And yep. uh, how can you come in here and suggest that we change? So you need something there that's driving the change. Uh, yes. I uh, did a work, some work with a company back in the uh, 1990s, I think. They were a short run printing company. Mm -hmm. And they've been growing nicely, and all of a sudden, they uh, they stopped growing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the guy who owned the company was pretty sharp, and he looked around and said, well, what's changed is the laser printer. Yep. People don't need to buy our product anymore. They can just run it right out of their laser printer. So they knew that their industry was going to become more competitive and that uh, pricing was going to be more like a commodity as opposed to, you know, professional services. And uh, that drove the change because yes. they knew they had to change. And, uh, you know, so what we worked with them on was getting that change to move to a continual improvement process. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and also to look for things that may be driving internal competition in the company and how would we identify those things and move them out so that we could enable a more internal collaborative uh, work environment. Yes. Not just for the employees, but for the managers also. They had five operations around the country. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies would have them competing with each other. Yes. And we moved toward, let's move to an internally collaborative so that if an order comes in in Dallas, and Dallas is already got more than they can handle, then he can ship that order to Philadelphia and they can make it there. Customer didn't care where it came from. They just needed the product. Yep. So, so we, uh, you know, we moved toward it developing and establishing an internally collaborative work environment as opposed to an internally competitive work environment. Yep. Okay, good. C can I just briefly before we move on say if we all agree that the stuff in the right hand column is the way it should be that raises a very big question of why it isn't already if we can all look at that and say well of course that's the way it should be then why aren't companies like this but let's go to a different approach because the headline says the power of identifying causes here we've got the inputs to the indexer model and these are the sum of the 26 questions that we ask. Now, you can take any one of those you like, but if we want to shift from the left hand column, and Robert, you'll be delighted to see all these short term numbers represented in that very first question. Uh, if we want to shift from the left-hand column to the right, how do we actually do that? And the answer is relatively simply. But don't try and make connections, linear connections from the right-hand column back to the call, back to the symptoms that we looked at on the previous page because of this many-to-many -many model. But one of the joys, if you take the very first 
question, for example. Managers tend to ask questions about recent or current results, ask questions about developmental actions to improve output performance. That is part of our many-to-many -many model. And if we said, okay, well, we can fix that, we can start to say to people, we'll stop asking those bloody silly questions and ask this sort instead. Because of the many-to-many -many model, that's going to impact on many outputs by definition. So it doesn't actually matter where we enter the mix. And what we do is we take the specific spikes from the charts, we go back into the database and we find the questions where the answers produce the greatest impact on the outputs. And then we say, well, change the behavior. We, we, know, we're, we know we're hitting the, the inputs which have the highest output. So change those and the many to many model will take care of where you go from there. And then it becomes also very simple to um, do a, re a rerun to see what's happened as a consequence. Dennis? Yeah. Could I just ask a question? With, within the change, how much of an impediment is the current management reporting uh, of numbers or yes. of the data a, a barrier to some of the things that you want to do? It, it is a yeah it is a barrier Kevin but I think the my reaction will be to say think about the interactions that go on between managers and staff and you've got tens of thousands going on every day of the week and that has a much bigger impact than the formal bits which happen occasionally you know the monthly report I agree that they are negative um, and I've never personally understood the need for great reams of monthly reports, but that's just me. Ben, I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Can we have the, I think we have one more slide. Yeah. We'll whiz through hair and progressive organizations. Right, back, back, back. Stop. Right. There's just a few things we'd like to put on the table right now. And that is, this is stuff that we've not actually covered, but it's implicit in what we've covered. The first one is this thing about control that we've talked about. And all the evidence we've ever seen is that what senior people have is an illusion of control. They don't actually have control at all. It just simply doesn't exist. And they've got a load of short-term financial numbers and they confuse those with the real business. They behave as if they represent the real business, but they don't. The old comment about the map is not the territory. So we are dealing with people who have an illusion of control, but don't actually have it. But they also have an illusion of power and they confuse positional authority with the power to actually make ch change happen. And power, all that means is you can tell people. And when you tell people what to do for all the reasons we've discussed, they normally go into malicious obedience mode and don't take a scrap of notice of what they've been told. So it's another illusion. But there is another illusion coming up. And this is the illusion of no power. Well, I'm only a middle manager. I can't change anything. I'm, I'm, a, I'm only you know, the victim mentality, if you like. And these are people in middle management positions who think that they can't make change happen. Think back to the inputs to the change enabled organization model. And that, that is also an illusion, Ben. Because if we concentrate on those practices and processes, which are the inputs, it's actually possible to make huge change happen all quietly. And I love the Jim Collins concept of the flywheel. We keep giving it little nudges and more little nudges and it goes faster and faster until it's completely unstoppable. But we all have that power. It is an illusion to say that we don't. And the last little thought just to prove that nothing in management is new because this, com this comes from three and a half thousand years ago. 
first find people you can trust and then trust them and they won't let you down is the message mm. ben thank you dan uh we are just about uh, wrapping up time um dennis and i will be delighted to share with you the um input model to the um change enabled organization um, john can get that to you all uh, hopefully today or tomorrow um, so that is coming your way anyway it's our little gift to you guys as dennis described it doesn't really matter where you start if you start moving from left to right on that model in one or two of those areas then you will find that your organization or your team if that is your sphere of influence um, is much much more likely to exhibit traits of change enablement as opposed to change disablement and thinking again about our current circumstances the organizations that will survive in these deeply unpredictable and turbulent times will be the ones that are able to organically and seem seamlessly and almost in real time move and adapt very very quickly and respond to those changes um, so before we go are there any closing thoughts or questions that uh, we have yeah barry well, uh, just something to reflect upon really is that if we think back to to deming and his philosophy and how many years ago uh, was that was that 40 50 years ago now i lose track of time um, so, so much of what Deming was recommending was shifting or was seeking to shift organizations from the left to the right, as you say that. I've got a book here, Whoosh, by Tom McGeehy, who talked about creating creation companies. That was his word, creation companies. That was 20 years ago uh, he wrote that. Uh, at the, 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 so, so reflect upon what we need to do is... <laughs> Um, we've had good, some good initiatives, but they haven't resulted in this change that we need to see. So I think one something to keep in the frame where, as you go forward with this is, is how can this be different? How, how can this actually get a following that's mm. big, big enough to make a difference? So sure. I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Barry. I'd, I'd just like to thank everyone. I, th I really found it interesting last half and uh, 90 minutes and uh, thanks for all the input. There's so much that aligns with what I do. So really interesting for me. So thanks, gentlemen. Good. Thanks, is, it, is it possible to get the, uh, the session you did on motivation? Is that recorded or anything? The session we did on motivation? Yeah. Uh, I, I missed it. I missed it. No, I, I think that's still to come. John, that's your session oh. I think Robert's talking about. Yeah, I'm running the motivation okay. one on the 3rd and the 20th of next month, Robert. All right. I'll Love to see you on that. And all the word. Will we, okay. all get, will we all get a record, uh, a link to this, the recording of this? That would be good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Good, good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Excellent. Good Dennis. to see you all. Um, Dennis and I are very, very happy to field uh, questions. We'll hang on if people have the time now, or please do get in touch with us via uh, John. Um, more than happy to um, continue the conversation. It's been great. Thank you so much for your time and thank you Robert for doing saving me a job in terms of plugging John's sessions next month <laughs> on disentangling motivation from performance which I'm sure we will all be looking forward to. Good uh, well, stuff. You know, I, I have to get up before breakfast to do this. <laughs> your commitment's huge Robert. Oh yes. We do, we do appreciate it. <laughs> good stuff. Very Take nice. care everybody. Good. Enjoy the rest thank of the week. Up. Have a good thank one. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. Are you going to move to a sort of um, what is it called? Uh, the view where you see you see more people.